I just did the video change and it worked. That's do my own tech support. Good morning, reInvent. I, I have to admit, when I found out that I had an 8.30 a.m. session on Friday after the party, I was convinced there were only going to be five people in here and they were going to be sleeping in the corner of the room. And they were only going to be here because they just got lost on the way back to the rooms from the party and, and never actually made it. So thank you guys very much for coming. My name is Everett Dolgner. I am the storage specialist solutions architect for EMEA. Imagine having to say that every time you introduce yourself. That's a lot of words. Uh, today we're going to talk about migrating data into AWS. And just to kind of level set, this is a 200 session. So that means that if you're here for code samples, you're in the wrong room. If you were in my session last year, it's about 50% the same. So we will talk about a bunch of new stuff that just launched this week. Um, but if you're also, if you're here for tell me exactly how to do it, that's not this session. So I just want everybody to, to kind of understand that up front. So we're going to do some high level stuff. We're going to talk about the services. We will go in depth on things and I'll tell you how some stuff works. And I will give you tips and tricks um, kind of where they make sense. And then we'll have a little bit of, a little bit of time at the end for QA. And then unfortunately, I have to run straight to the airport because I have to get on a plane to make the 19 hour flight home. So I live in Germany, by the way. So let's jump in. This is our agenda. We're going to talk about transfer services at AWS. We're going to talk about why are you migrating? And then how do you do it? What are the things that we have at AWS? And I think Andy Jassy during the keynote said there are 11 services to do transfer. I'm not talking about 11. We don't have enough time and 50 minutes and questions to talk about 11 services. So we're going to talk about the highlights. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about hybrid storage and how you can bridge the gap between your data center and AWS without having to do things like buy new applications or rewrite all your applications. And I'm sorry to the camera person because I realize I keep going over there and that's the dark part of the stage. But by the way, there's usually a pool going because I tend to walk right up to the front of the stage and kind of put my toes right there. Um, so there's normally a pool going to see if I'm going to fall off the stage. And being 8.30 in the morning and I'm not heavily caffeinated yet, today could be the day so you might witness something fun. So let's start with kind of the AWS portfolio. And of course, this is not the entire storage offering at AWS. There are other versions of this slide. This is kind of cut down just for the things that we're going to be talking about today. So you know from our core offerings that we have file. We have, we've had EFS. We just launched uh, two versions of FSX for Lustre and for Windows this week. We have EBS for uh, block storage inside AWS. And then we've got our kind of our core object storage offerings with S3 and with Glacier. And what we really want to talk about is on the left-hand side. So I'm not going to tell you where to put the data, but I'm going to help tell you how to get it there. When you start to think about doing data transfers and, and how you're going to put your data in, we do have a lot to offer. Um, from this slide, the, the important takeaway is there's kind of three different mindsets, three different ways to do it. On the far left, we've got online data transfer. And that's, that's the version of, I need to get the data there, but I can't take any downtime to do it. So I want to transfer from my data center into AWS. I don't want to shut the application down. I don't want to wait for the data to get there so that I can start processing it again. But I want to start the transfer. I want to keep working with the data. And maybe this is for DR. Maybe you're making a backup copy. We hear about compliance copies. Or maybe you actually are migrating the application, but you don't want to turn it off first. You want to do the main bulk transfer while everything is online. So that's what online data transfer is about, at least for this session. We do have things like Kinesis Firehose, where you can um, manage the process of importing like IoT data and multiple streams of data and even video data coming in. We're not talking about that today. Um, but there's some really interesting sessions that we've had this week that, that talk about those things. So we're going to talk about Direct Connect, Transfer Acceleration for S3, Data Sync, Snowball, and Storage Gateway. The clicker didn't work. Uh, there we go. So why are we here? This is not the existential, like, who am I? Why am I here? You know, why did I get out of bed this morning? It's because my alarm went off at 6 a.m. This is the 
what are we, what are we really doing when we're going into the cloud? Again, we're, we're talking about moving your data. We see applications moving into the cloud, data sets moving in, and it could be for pre-processing, for post-processing, for compliance copies. There are a lot of reasons to move data out of your data center and to put it into AWS. And certainly, I can't tell you all of them. I'm, I'm sure that out of everybody that's in the room, you have more reasons to move your data than I can think of. So you know why you're here from a data transfer standpoint. This is why we're all in the room today, though. Five things to think about. If you've done a data transfer, you've probably run into some of these. If you haven't done a migration into the cloud or into even another data center, um, then something to take away, something to think about when you start to do your plan before you're migrating data. The first, what is it and where is it going? Seems simple, right? I have a lot of conversations that start with, we've got a petabyte and a half of data and we want to put it into the cloud. Well, okay, what's it on? Well, we've got like nine different arrays. What's the application? There's like 200 applications. How's the data broken up? Well, each application has its own data and it's on a different array. How do you migrate that? Like, that's not a good place to start. You're kind of starting with chaos. So what kind of data is it? Where is it going? Is it one time or is it continuous? Are you going to shut the application off, move all of the data, do a permanent migration, stand up the environment inside of AWS and never look back? Is it test data? Is it compliance data that you have to migrate every single day, maybe even every hour? You need to understand what it is, where it's going, how, how often you're going to put it there. One way or bi-directional. Are you only coming into AWS or are you putting data into AWS and taking it back out? You guys familiar with Snowball? Did you know that you can actually take data out of AWS with Snowball? You can place a Snowball order. We will fill it with data from a bucket and send it back to you. So you need to understand, again, is it just coming in, just going out, or is it going to be moving both directions? How much data and time do you have? This is always a fun one. When I used to do disaster recovery in a, in a previous company, everyone would always say, my application is the most important application, and without it, the company would go out of business within 24 hours, and so I can lose absolutely zero data. And then they would find out how much it costs to lose zero data and to be able to replicate everything. This is kind of the same conversation. You can replicate a lot of data or migrate a lot of data and transfer a lot of data very quickly. It takes a lot of bandwidth. It takes a lot of planning. And bandwidth can sometimes be pricey. So it's good to understand. And you can kind of see where we're starting from here. What do I have? Where is it? Where is it going? One way or bi-directional. How much time do I have to get it there? And then if you're going over the network, what about the WAN? You, you can't discount this one. If you come to us and say, I've got a petabyte of data and I need to move it over my one gigabit link and it has to get there in four days, you're going to have a bad time. It's not going to go that fast. So we need to plan for these things in advance. And that's what this is about, is just taking some time up front, go old school, build a spreadsheet, start to figure out what these things are, where they live, and then you can start to make intelligent decisions about what's the best way to get it into the cloud? What service do I use? And how is AWS going to help me? So let's get to how AWS can help you. So we have Direct Connect. Any Direct Connect users in the room? I usually don't ask questions, but I feel this need at 8.30 in the morning on Friday after the party that I'm going to try and get you guys to like, do some, a little bit of aerobics and get some hands up so that we all stay awake. It's also for me. So with Direct Connect, this gives you the ability to buy a direct network link that comes straight into AWS. It goes through partner, but eventually you get a port into AWS that terminates into your VPC. The benefit of this is that you can buy as much bandwidth as you need, but the most important thing is that you get this direct connection into your VPC, you should have reasonable latency, and you should have zero packet loss. And we'll talk later in the, in the presentation when we get to S3 Transfer Acceleration about how latency and packet loss and packet out of orders are the enemy of performance when you're going over a network. So Direct Connect is available. It's a way for you to get that direct connection. 
what if I really want to put a lot of data in or take a lot of data out and I want to do it very quickly? Did anybody see the launch for Data Sync earlier this week? Andy talked about it on stage. I told you, it's going to be, we're doing aerobics now. It's one handed. Thank you for your participation. Data Sync is an online data transfer tool. So this kind of goes back to earlier when I talked about we have online transfer, we're going to talk about bulk transfer and offline transfer. This is the tool that lets you migrate active data. That means that this data could be in use. It's inside of your data center. You have an application that's polling it. You have users that are using it. But it lives in something. Maybe it's in a filer. And you want to get it into AWS. Could be time sensitive. We have a lot of customers really in the kind of the genomics and the healthcare space that are doing really interesting things where they're generating data sets in their labs. And what they figured out is they have a fixed amount of cores. So if you think about genomics, you're generating massive amounts of data that you need to process, you need to crunch the numbers, you need to then get results to researchers so that they can go develop new ways to fight cancer. And if it takes three weeks to get to that result, that's time lost. So what these customers are doing is they're taking these active data sets as they generate them, they're migrating them into AWS, and then they're using spot instances, which in EC2 is sort of the, the market where you can go and kind of bid on, hey, I need compute. And instead of using one or two or 10,000 cores, they're spinning up hundreds of thousands of cores, and they're getting to their result in days or hours instead of weeks. And if you think about something like cancer research or drug research, time is literally money, and more importantly, time is lives. So they're able to get to that result that much faster, and it's a competitive advantage for them, because certainly they're saving money because they don't have to buy all that stuff, and they can get to the result faster, and it's, it's kind of good for humanity as a whole, we hope. And then the last piece for the active data transfer is replication and business continuity. We talk to a lot of customers that might be doing their own replication. Maybe they've got a big iron NAS device and they're replicating to a second one. But that doesn't always solve the compliance problem. And it's maybe not a great disaster recovery story. I know one customer that replicates from one end of their data center to their other end of their data center. It's not a great disaster recovery story. So everybody remembers Hurricane Sandy. Do you know that a lot of the financial companies that were in lower Manhattan replicated over to New Jersey and they ran synchronously? So that was their DR plan. You know how long it took the data centers in southern New Jersey to go down after Manhattan went down? It's about four minutes for most of them because that storm was so big. So when you're thinking about disaster recovery and you're thinking about distance, this is a great way to be able to get data into AWS and you know, put it on the other side of the world, put it on the other side of the country. We have regions in, in a lot of locations so that you can put your data there and that you have some place that you can run. So Data Sync is a fast data transfer tool. It's easy to use. It's secure and reliable. It's enterprise grade. It's cost effective. Kind of all the things that you would expect from uh, a tool that, that just got released, a new service that just got released. But what's really interesting is that we've done a lot of work around resiliency and performance. So we've worked on our own upper layer protocols to be sure that as we start to send data that we're not only doing it very fast, but it's also reliable. So things like we will recover. We'll be able to restart transfers and, and pick back up if there's an issue. A lot of words on this slide. I'm not going to read this one to you. So I know there's a lot, everybody's taking pictures of slides. Take a picture of this one. We'll talk about some of the high points. The way that, that Data Sync is deployed, we'll talk about the fun stuff. The way that Data Sync deploy, is deployed, and we'll look at this in, in another couple of slides, is there's an agent that gets deployed inside of your data center. Agent's a virtual machine. So you run inside of your data center, each agent is capable of transferring it up to 10 gigabits per second. And I know some of you are thinking just because it has a 10 gigabit interface doesn't mean that you can say that it runs at 10 gigabits. It, it really does run at 10 gigabits. And we are really fast on small files. So you know that problem that you all have when you're trying to back up or you're trying to migrate or you're trying to replicate 
all those little 1K and 1 meg files and you've got millions or hundreds of millions or billions of them, we do that really, really fast. So if you have a 10 gig link and you have a storage array that's fast enough to get that data off at 10 gigs, we can migrate those files at 10 gigs into AWS. If you have a 100 gig link, you just deploy 10 agents. So we will fill the available bandwidth that you have. All of this is managed through the AWS console. So you deploy the virtual machine, the, the uh, sync agent, sorry, data sync agent, I gotta remember to keep saying that. Sorry, Asa, the general manager of our services in the back of the room, and so I you know, keep saying virtual machine. You deploy the data sync agent in your data center, everything is managed through the console. So you activate it, you create the jobs, everything that you need to do is through the AWS console. You don't actually have to touch the, um, the VM. Everything's validated. So when you first start a job, you point us at an NFS export, we can migrate the entire, or sync the entire export, or sync just subdirectories. The first thing we're gonna do is figure out what do we need to move, and then we're gonna be very cautious about moving it, and make sure that we've moved everything, and that when it gets to the other end, that it's actually there and it works. We do have PCI compliance, we are HIPAA eligible. We have full integration with IAM and CloudTrail and CloudWatch and all of the other tools that you're using to kind of manage your AWS environment today. You can use those with DataSync. And it's four cents per gig. So it's pretty reasonably priced when you think about what it would take to have to do it on your own. There are open source tools available, so you can download those and build them. And then figure out how to optimize it and spend time tuning it and figure out how you're gonna make it talk to S3 on the other end and how you're gonna mount your, your NFS export and you're gonna get the best performance out of it. Or for four cents a gig, you can just download the data sync agent, deploy it at your data center, create a new sync job and start transferring your data in just a few minutes. It really is this simple. Download the sync agent, run it in ESXi and VMware, point it in an NFS export, decide what you want to sync, and figure out where you want to put it. S3 or EFS. And it's bi-directional, which means that you can use it to put data in, you can also use it to take data out. That's why we work really hard to have good services that are reliable and bring you a lot of good features, because we do make it easy to get your data back out. So we, we work really hard to make sure that you're happy and that we have the things that make you want to put data in and, and keep it there. Just from an architecture level, you can see we've got our shared file system on the left, NFS connection to the data sync agent. Everything in flight is encrypted. We never send data in the clear. It's always sent encrypted. In fact, by default, I think all AWS services now are encrypted. You know, if you, if you want to make something insecure, you really have to work hard at it. And for something like data sync, we don't even give you the option. There's no way to have it go unencrypted. We also compress the data before it gets sent over the wire. And you can see on the far right in the AWS side, we actually stand up part of the service. So this is a managed service. That means that you don't have to think about what's going inside of your VPC or how uh, that stuff is created or how it's connected. You tell us what you want to go from and where you want to put it. And that's the only thing that you have to think about. Another interesting thing that you can do with data sync, and we're going to talk about storage gateway later in the presentation, but if we have this environment where we've got a NAS device and we've got some applications connected to it, we deploy our data sync agent, we're migrating our data in, and here we're using a direct connect. On the other side, we've got the data sync managed service. We're landing in an S3 bucket. Now we can stand up a storage gateway. Storage Gateway is going to give you access to that S3 uh, bucket, in this case we're using a file gateway, using standard storage protocols. So NFS and SMB, and we'll, we'll go more into a deep dive on that later. And then you can take out the old stuff. So you've just done a complete migration of data off of your NAS into an S3 bucket, stood up a file gateway, your application is still reading and writing the same data. It's still accessing it, even though it lives in S3, using the same protocols that it was using to connect to your on-site NAS. 
Only now you're doing it through Storage Gateway. All the data lives in the cloud. You get 11 nines of a durability. You get uh, all of the availability, and you're doing it at 2.3 cents a gig. So it's a pretty good way to be able to get data out, do the migration, and then still make it available in the same way to the application and to your end users. Next, we're going to talk about the Snowball family. And I'm going to stop for some caffeine first. Okay, let's talk about Snowball. So we first launched Snowball in 2015. And I haven't been out onto the expo floor to see if we brought one, but I heard a yes. Fun thing to do, it's too late in the week for this, but normally if you go out and you, and you go to where the Snowball is, you're going to see this. Everyone wants a selfie with the snowball, and I haven't, I've been watching it happen for years, and I haven't figured it out yet. Like, I always call it, like, it's the part of the cloud you can touch. And when I first started with AWS, I think I'd been on board for two or three months, and I, I went to uh, our public sector summit in D.C. is when I still lived in the U.S. And they said, okay, we need you to, you know, stand with the snowball and answer questions. I'm like, okay, cool, I have that. The number one question, can I take a selfie with it? The number two question is not what you think it is, though. Can I drop it? Because this was back when we would do keynotes and they would talk about, oh, it's rugged, it'll take an eight and a half G drop, it weighs 47 pounds, and it tells, can I drop it? I, I, and the answer was always, no, you can't. I have. I've actually done a presentation where I kicked one off the front of a stage just to make sure that everybody was still awake. We don't have one here, so I can't do that. But. Um, Ruggedized device, way to move data offline. So with data sync, we talked about moving data online. I'm reading it off the storage. It could still be in use. It's still active. Snowball is about, well, I can shut the app down or I can do the transfer. And if it takes a week to get there or five or six days and, and go through the validation process, that's okay. That's where Snowball fits. So we released Snowball. The next year we did Snowball Edge and Snowmobile. Is anybody here for the Snowmobile launch? You guys are either falling asleep or you're just, you weren't here. So we've got a few hands. Go watch the video on YouTube of the Snowmobile introduction because it's kind of funny because we talk about, we introduced Snowball and you know, now we have the Snowball Edge and, but what do you do when you have hundreds of petabytes of data or exabytes of data? And the band starts playing and the door to the keynote room opens up and smoke comes in and they drive a tractor trailer in. And you can see a few people kind of laugh and chuckle thinking it's a joke because why is a cloud company driving a 45 foot tractor trailer onto the show floor? And then Andy said, this is the snowmobile. This is how we can move 100 petabytes of data out of your data center into AWS in you know, 30 or 60 days. And that's when everybody went, oh my God, it's real. So that was Snowmobile. So we did all of those things, and then customers came back to us and said, but I have these other use cases. Snowball's cool for doing the offline transfer. Snowmobile's amazing. If I have 100 petabytes, you can use it with like 10 petabytes of data. But I have these other use cases where I've got environments that I need a rugged device, and I also need compute. And that's when things started to change with Snowball Edge. We added Lambda, we added Greengrass, this year, we added the ability to run EC2 instances. And so we see customers putting these things on research vessels and sending them out to sea. And it used to be they would use hard drives. And you know, a single spinning magnetic rust disk hard drive in a metal case is not super reliable. So imagine you've been out at sea for 90 days, you've been doing all this research, you're collecting all the data, you have a box of drives. Ship gets back into port, you take your bag or your box full of drives, you get in a taxi, you get back to the university, you hand them off to a grad student or an underling somewhere who starts plugging in these USB hard drives, and six to eight weeks later they've copied most of the data up because one of the drives failed, so you lost, lost a couple of days worth of research. Using Snowball Edge on that same vessel, they're able to go out to sea, collect all of that data, and running Lambda and EC2 instances, they're actually able to pre-process it 
and to tag it and to sort it so that when they get back to shore, they hand it off to the UPS driver. It comes back to AWS, we load it into the S3 bucket, and the researchers and the scientists can start using the data immediately. So we've gone from weeks and months to be able to actually take action on the data to be able to do it in just a couple of days. And we're seeing the same thing in industrial spaces and in healthcare and in transportation. Some of you would be surprised at how much data self-driving cars collect. All the cameras, all the sensors, everything that's going on, all of that gets recorded. It's tens of terabytes of data every time the car goes out and drives around. So it's another great way to, to be able to process and get that data back. I am not going to go into the use cases here because we're going to run out of time. But I think everybody saw Fender on stage. I was a little jealous when they gave Werner the Telecaster, the American Standard Telecaster yesterday. I'll just leave it at that. Fender, if, if you guys are watching the video. I live in Berlin. I'll take one. The traditional Snowball, 80 terabytes of capacity. This is a device just to write the data to. Snowball Edge. This year we launched Compute Optimized and we have Storage Optimized. 42 terabytes of S3 capacity or 100 terabytes of S3 capacity. They both run EC2 instances and have compute. I'll show you in the next slide how they're different. 8.5G case, snowmobile holds 100 petabytes, GPS tracking, alarm, 24-7 surveillance. The important thing to know about the Snow family all of the data that is written to any of these devices is always encrypted before it lands on disk. The keys to decrypt the data never travel with the device. So that means that you write all the data to it, it lands encrypted, you ship it back, it's encrypted in transit and there's no way to get it out. We also have a TPM chip on the motherboard, we fingerprint the OS and we check some it every single time it boots up. So if somebody tried to get in electronically and make any changes, we would be able to tell and it actually won't boot. If it fails any checks, we won't connect it to the network and we won't uh, transfer the data into your S3 bucket. We will actually destroy it and send you another one. Compute optimized and storage optimized. So up until this week, we just had Snowball Edge. That is now the storage optimized device. 32 gigs of RAM. 24 virtual CPUs, one terabyte of disk space for the EC2 instances. We just launched Compute Optimized, which gives you 42 terabytes of S3, 208 gigs of RAM, 52 virtual CPUs, 7.62 terabytes of SSD for the EC2 instances, and you have the option of getting it with an NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPU. So if you think about movies and television shows and things that are done out on site in, in, in an environment where they're doing dailies and they're recording every day, now you have the ability to do transcoding on the same device that you're storing the data on so that you can get the dailies back and then you can transfer them off to wherever they need to be so that the studio can look at them every single day. And you don't have to transfer the full files and then get someone else to do the transcoding. So this is a way to get intelligence and compute closer to the storage in offline and in, in ruggedized environments. A couple of key takeaways from, from Snowball Edge. There's an S3 endpoint. You can run a file gateway on it. So it comes on there by default. So you can, you can have NFS access to that S3 endpoint. They're pretty fast, green grass and lambda. We've talked about a lot of this. Um, and I said at the beginning, this is kind of 200 level, but I'll tell you one tip for using the Snowball Edge. With data sync, and where I said we're really fast with all those small files, if you want to write small files to a Snowball Edge, if this is an offline transfer, we've actually added an option where you can batch those up. You can create a tarball or a zip. And when you copy the tarball or the zip or multiple of them into the Snowball Edge, in the command line, you can tell it that this data has been zipped. And we put it in S3, we'll actually explode it back out to the individual files. So if you're moving millions of 1K files and you're using a Snowball Edge to do it, compress that stuff together first into you know, one really big file or a bunch of big files, and you, it, you're going to have a much better experience doing the data transfer. 
So ordering the new Snowball Edge, when you go into the console, it's pretty straightforward. Storage optimized, compute optimized, or compute with the GPU. Just tick the box for the one that you need and create the rest of the job. With the current Snowball Edge, I realize that little um, red box there is a little difficult to see, but if somebody tries to break into the device, so it's made out of plastic, so if somebody tries to pry it open, you'll be able to tell and we'll be able to tell. If they get the side off, those little tabs that are highlighted actually break. And we make our own screws. So the screws that are in it go one way and it's a specialized uh, or special end so that they can't just unscrew it and take it apart. So that's the uh, Snowball Edge storage optimized. With compute optimized, and I don't have a picture, if I did, it would actually just look like this. We've put NFC chips underneath those little tabs. So now you can get an app, or next month you'll be able to get an app for your phone, and you can scan the NFC tabs on the device to see if anybody's tried to tamper with it physically. All right, 30 minutes left, and we are a little more than halfway through. We're going to get through this together. And then I'm going to go home, and you guys are going to have the rest of a day. So, so SFTP, again, our, our Monday morning reInvent, or Friday morning reInvent aerobics, who's using SFTP? OK, I promise we won't record this part, who's still using FTP. No one ever wants to put their hand up. When we do our like customer meetings, we talk about this, and everybody goes, SFTP, that's amazing. And th this service is going to go crazy because everybody uses SFTP, and it never fails that there's someone in the room that goes very timidly, uh, we're still using FTP. And then that's when it becomes a safe space, and everybody else goes, yeah, yeah so do we. <laughs> SFTP is out there. We're still using it. It's still how we're moving data around. And for most companies, it's, t it's just tied into the workflow. I mean, we've heard from retail and healthcare and banking that SFTP is the way that we get data between clinics, or it's the way that we get daily financial results out of a store so that we get all the sales numbers back. I'm not sure what the financial guys are using it for, but they all are. So there's a lot of SFTP out there. We want to give you a way to easily migrate those workflows into AWS, give you a secure environment, and give you reliable and durable storage on the back end without having to change the client on the front end or change your workflow or change the way that your partners and your customers or your employees are interacting with the service. So transfer for SFTP, seamless migration of your existing workflows. It's a fully managed service. Who likes to patch servers, operating systems, fixing the hole in the SFTP server that just got discovered that's been there for five years that means that your data wasn't quite as secure as you thought it was because of the SFTP server that you happened to deploy? No one likes doing that stuff. This is all fully managed. We'll do that for you. We also have native integration with the AWS services. I talked before about how uh, Sync, Data Sync, is integrated in with CloudWatch and CloudTrail and all the management monitoring tools that we have. So is SFTP. Very simple to use. We we'll even let you bring your own host name. Probably have a DNS name. If you're doing SFTP, it's entirely possible it's on the internet somewhere so that your clients, your customers can easily get to it. We let you bring that with you. If it's SFTP, you already have security in place. You already have certificates in place that their users are using to authenticate with. We let you bring those with you. So you can take the environment that you're managing today. You can deploy it inside of AWS with transfer for SFTP. And you can stop managing SFTP servers. This is probably what your architecture looks like now. We hear from a lot of customers that we missed a slide. There was a slide missing. This is what happens at 8.30 in the morning on a Friday. This is what your architecture will look like. So we talked about you managing your server and deploying it. And, and one of the things that we saw in the slide that, was, that you didn't get to see, what I was going to talk about is that a lot of our customers have come to us and said, I've built this on my own. 
I've stood up a Linux instance in EC2 and I figured out how to make it highly available and I put an SFTP server on it and I'm doing something. There are many ways that you can make Linux talk to S3. And I made it talk to S3 on my own and it took me hours, days, and it takes me hours to manage it as well because I have to keep dealing with this whole environment. So moving to transfer for SFTP, this is what your, your environment looks like. You tick the box to turn on a new SFTP server, you give it a name. If you're gonna use your own DNS name, you use Route 53 to redirect to it. You create your users. You can have IAM policies to manage security. You connect it to your S3 bucket, and then you stop managing SFTP. It really is that simple. You can deploy an SFTP environment connected to S3 on the back end in just a couple of minutes and make it available to your end users. 24 minutes left, one large part of the presentation. We can do this together, and then we're gonna have questions, and then we can all go get heavily caffeinated. Storage Gateway family gives you the ability to take AWS storage, S3 and EBS snapshots and Glacier, storage that's durable and reliable and available, and take advantage of it inside of your own data center. So if you think about the process that you go through to add storage in your data center, one of our customers, uh, King, does anybody know who King is? I do this in every session and it always ends the same way. No hands. Who knows what Candy Crush is? I hear from the Snickers that you know what Candy Crush is, uh, and that was not intended, that, that, that was an accidental, uh, Correlation there, Snickers and Candy Crush. So King makes Candy Crush. And talking to the storage administrator there, he told me about how they'll have developers, or they'll have an idea, or they have something they want to try, and somebody will come to him and say, I need 10 terabytes of storage now. And if you've tried to order storage from a big iron vendor or an enterprise vendor, you know that it usually starts with a price negotiation. And then you get through that, and then you place the order for the storage, and then it goes on to their log, and then they build it, and then they put it on a truck, and then they ship it to you. And then it usually comes wrapped in some PS, and they come out, and they install it, and they stand it up, and then you connect it to the server. And six weeks later, the 10 terabytes of storage that they needed now is available. Or the worst one that I hear is they run out to, like, a local electronics store and somebody buys a little tiny NAS device or a bunch of hard drives and they turn it on real fast and they just hope that it's gonna work. That's kind of the old school way of doing things. With Storage Gateway, specifically with our Volume Gateway, we actually give you the ability to deploy storage in your data center in minutes backed by S3 and EBS inside of AWS. And we'll talk a little bit more about architecture as we, as we move on. We have a VTL offering that lets you retape, pl replace tape and put that data into S3 and into Glacier. And with our file gateway, we give you SMB and NFS access to S3. And one of the things that we hear, one of the things that I hear, is customers coming in and saying, I have these applications, I really want to use S3, but the application doesn't support it. And you know the most frustrating answer to get back as a customer in that environment? We'll just change the application and make it talk to the S3 API, and then it'll be fully integrated. You can write all your data to S3. Who has time for that? That's, that's what I thought. No hands, by the way, for those of you who can't see. File Gateway gives you the ability to take those applications that already support native storage protocols like SMB and NFS, and connect them to an S3 bucket using that native protocol. You don't have to change the application. You just deploy the file gateway, mount it, drive letter. Now you can start taking advantage of S3. Where that really becomes interesting is once the data is in S3, you have the entire S3 ecosystem living around that data. So things like Athena and Select and EMR and the list goes on. 
even partner tools that you can run inside of AWS to interact with that data and to give you new value and to give you new insights into the data that you already have. And you didn't have to change the application. You just spun up a virtual machine or put a hardware appliance in that allowed you to connect to S3. So we have three different types of gateways in the family. We've got the file gateway, and we'll go into a little bit deeper dive on all of these, which gives you that file system access to S3. We've got the volume gateway that gives you iSCSI block volume devices, and we have the tape gateway. A couple of common things, industry standard storage protocols, SMB, NFS, iSCSI. We're not doing anything proprietary on the front end to these connections. We're using protocols that you're already using in your data centers and your remote sites. Every single one of these devices has cache. Cache gives you fast local response. So when you write data, excuse me, to any of these devices, it gets written into the cache. When you do a read, if the data's in the cache, we read it back out of cache. So it improves the performance. We've done a lot of work to optimize the transfer to get the data up to AWS and even to read it back down if it's not in the cache. And again, fully integrated with all the AWS services like IAM and CloudTrail and CloudWatch. We're not gonna dive into, well, really any of these, but we have a lot of customers that are using it across many segments, many verticals, many industries, and they're doing some really cool stuff. We talked a little bit about king.com but you can see that we have manufacturing and financial and oil and gas and lots of stuff, lots of customers that are using Storage Gateway in really innovative ways. In fact, Home24 is on the right-hand side of that. They're based in Berlin. And uh, when I furnished my apartment, they actually do, uh, uh, you can shop for furniture online and they just deliver it to you. I think half my apartment is furnished by Home24. So thank you to the guys at Home24. File gateway. We talked a little bit about this already, how NFS and SMB, it's a virtual machine, it has cache. We also have a hardware appliance. The important thing that I want you to take away from file gateway is that not only does it give you that native file system, file share access to an S3 bucket, and you can have 10 buckets connected to a file gateway. Each bucket will be represented as either an NFS or an SMB exporter file share. When you write the data to the file gateway and it goes into the cache and you get that response back and we start uploading it, we're gonna do multi-part uploads. We're also gonna encrypt everything as it's going across the wire. And we even take the hash value for every part and for every file. And when we do the put into S3, we include the hash value. And that means that if the data goes to S3 and S3 sends back an okay, it's verified the hash value. So we know, and you know, that the data that left the file gateway is exactly the same as the data that ended up in S3, because we're doing it as part of the put. And when that data lands in S3, it's not obfuscated in any way. That means that we're not deduping it, we're not compressing it, and the only encryption that we're using is the encryption that's already built into the service, so the encryption that S3 already provides. And you may be thinking, but I want dedupe and encryption. We have partners that do that, and that do that very well. But with File Gateway, File System Interface to S3. So that means that your applications want to take advantage of S3, and if you put your data into S3 and it's application data, you probably want to process it and to do other things with it. And if we deduplicate it and compress it, that means that things like Athena and EMR and all of the other tools in, in the S3 ecosystem won't be able to read it. So we leave it in the native format. With the volume gateway, we talked a little bit about this with King. Again, everything is encrypted in flight. This is a fully managed service. So that means that the data lands, all the blocks land in S3. You actually don't have access to the S3 bucket. It's a fully managed service. So the only way to get that data back out is to use another volume gateway or use the same volume gateway to read it back out. It's also stored compressed. And when you get billed, you actually get billed on the compressed number. So we charge you for what's being stored on disk. 
with a volume gateway, you can deploy 32 32 terabyte LUNs in cached volume mode. That gives you one petabyte of addressable storage. Just for fun, a few years ago, I took a volume gateway with 150 gigabytes of cache, which is the smallest amount of cache you can give it. I created 32 32 terabyte LUNs, mounted them into a single storage pool on one Windows file server, formatted a one petabyte file system, and proceeded to write a bunch of data to it. And it worked. I do not recommend that you do this. It's a really bad idea. 150 gigabytes is not enough cache for one petabyte of capacity. But I just wanted to prove it could be done. By the way, this question always comes up at the end. Cache size, whatever your working data set is, so you may have 10 terabytes of data, but if you're only using about 500 gigs a day, cache size around your working data set and make it a little bit larger, because nothing stays static. It's, go it's going to grow. And you can add additional cache space to it. But if you've got 500 gigs in your working data set, start with about 750 in the cache. If you have 10 terabytes, start with about 12 terabytes in the cache. So all the data that gets stored through this service, compressed and encrypted in S3, and then you can take snapshots of it. You can even clone the volumes. And the snapshots are stored uh, as EBS snapshots. We also give you the option of connecting LUNs that already have data on them. So if you're doing a migration, or if you just want to start backing up or snapshotting into AWS, you can take LUNs that have data, give them to the volume gateway, pass them through to the application server, and we leave everything intact. We don't change the volume ID or the signature or anything. The only thing that's going to be different is the application server is now mounting it over an iSCSI connection to the volume gateway. And we will take all of that existing data and we will transfer it up into the service for you. So it's a great way to do a migration. It's also a great way to go from a fully provisioned array to using cloud storage and then going to a thin provisioned environment. With the tape gateway, we give you 10 tape drives, 1,500 slots, and you can create tapes up to two and a half terabytes in size. So you get one petabyte of addressable capacity in the library itself. That's the slots and the drives. And the way this works is if you write data to a tape, <coughs> that's why I have the handheld. If you write data to a tape, that data is being stored in S3, if it's in the drive or in a tape slot. If you've been doing tape backup, and we all have for the last 20 or 30 years, you export the tape out of the library, you put it in the box, you lock it, you hand it to the person, they put it in the truck, they drive it away someplace else. You hope that you're not that picture on the internet of the truck burning down that has all the tapes in it. I don't know if you guys have seen that photo, but there are a few of them out there. And then you hope that when you need the tape later, that they can find it, that they can get it back to you, and that it's readable. Because tape, can, tape can be brittle. With the VTL, with the Storage Gateway VTL, when you write the data to it, it's being stored in S3. If you export that tape out of the virtual tape library, we mark it as read-only. We copy it into Glacier, which we call the virtual tape shelf. And you can leave it there for long keeping, long-term storage at 4 tenths of a cent per gig. So it gets pretty inexpensive pretty quickly to be able to do these backups and then keep archive copies of those tapes in the service. I know I say virtual machine a lot when I talk about Storage Gateway, and I've tried to include hardware appliance. So just a few months ago, we launched a hardware appliance. So we kept hearing from customers, virtual machines are great. I've got a VMware infrastructure. I've got a Hyper-V infrastructure, and it's in my data center but I want to put something out into a remote site or into an office, and I don't want to put a server out there to run VMware so that I can run your virtual machine so that I can put a file gateway in to let users access data that's in an S3 bucket. So we launched a hardware appliance that lets you do that. We also heard, strangely enough, from some of our customers that have outsourced IT that it's incredibly difficult for them to be able to get a virtual machine deployed into their own environment inside of their own data center because a third party manages it and it's out of scope and they have to pay more and they have to wait weeks. 
Now you can just order a hardware appliance and stick it in a rack, and you can start using the storage gateway service. We also run inside of EC2, which means that not only can you deploy it into your own virtual infrastructure, you can deploy it into our infrastructure, or you can deploy hardware. So you've got a lot of flexibility to be able to deploy all of the storage gateway modes wherever you need it to be. We're going to talk about transfer acceleration, one slide on our partners, and then we'll go to Q&A. So I talked earlier about latency and packet loss being the enemy of performance when it comes to moving data over distance. So in this example, you can see that we've got an S3 bucket on the east coast of the United States, and it looks like we have an end user in, uh, in India. If you're going over the internet to be able to interact with this S3 bucket to read or write data, you've probably got about 300 milliseconds of latency. And typically going over the internet, you have one-tenth of 1% 1 packet loss, which does not sound like a lot. But one-tenth of 1% 1 packet loss and as little as 80 milliseconds of latency and it doesn't matter how much bandwidth you have, a single TCP flow is going to run at about four and a half megabits per second. It's just the way TCP works. It's the congestion control algorithm. It's the send receive window size. And when you have that much latency, every time you drop a packet, congestion control kicks in. And that's when you get that sawtooth pattern that you've probably seen on bandwidth charts. It's we're ramping up, we drop something. We ramp up, we drop something. And that's when your 10 gigabit link runs at four and a half megabits for your data transfer application. Remember I said that data sync can run at 10 gigabits per second? We can even do that over a lossy, ugly network. So with S3 transfer acceleration, you're connecting directly to an S3 bucket. We give you the ability to use the global Amazon network. We have fiber under the oceans. We have fiber all over the world to take advantage of essentially our CDN in reverse. So instead of streaming data out and caching it locally, you can stream data in by using Route 53, connecting to the closest edge location to where your end user or application is, and entering the Amazon network at that point, and then transferring the data over the Amazon network. Very easy to get started. And I've, I've realized when I did this session two days ago that you can't read the blue. But if you go to to the S3 documentation, it's very easy. So you can see down on the bottom, S3 transfer acceleration is not enabled on the left, it is enabled on the right. You've just done 50% of the work to turn on transfer acceleration. The other thing that you have to do is use Route 53 and change the connection, and this is the part that you can't read, instead of going bucket.amazonaws.com, you say bucket.s3-accelerate.amazonaws.com. And now you're using S3 transfer acceleration every time you connect to that bucket. Notice I didn't say anything about changing your application or changing the APIs. The only thing you do, turn it on, Route 53 for DNS, change the name of the bucket, or change the name of the connection when you're connecting to the bucket. What this can do for performance, if you look at the far right in Singapore, if you're connecting to a bucket in Singapore and you're in Singapore, you have extremely low latency and you probably have almost no packet loss. As you move to the left of the slide, you're getting farther away. So all the way over on the left, we're at Rio de Janeiro, and you can see with transfer acceleration turned on, it takes less than half the time to be able to transfer data into that bucket than it does with transfer acceleration turned off. And that's measured in hours, by the way. So it's a very easy way to speed up access to an S3 bucket if you're going using a native protocol to talk to that S3 bucket, you're doing it over the internet. And the last thing that I want to talk about, and then we'll do, we have a few minutes for Q&A, is our partner network. So everything that we've talked about so far is AWS tools and things that AWS has built. We have a vast partner network that has spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort to take their applications and build in native integrations directly into AWS. Some of our partners will let you provision a new snowball job, create a bucket, order everything, put data into it, send it back, and they will manage the entire process and they'll know where the data is the entire time. So that at the end of the transfer, they know that the data is in the S3 bucket can, and can still manage it. We have customers or we have partners that do deduplication and compression behind um, file emulation and access devices to be able to get into an S3 bucket. 
customers or I keep saying customers. This is what happens when you go at 8.30 a.m. on a Friday. You pick the wrong word. Partners. We have partners that are built in disaster recovery and backup and all of these things, and most of them are available in the AWS marketplace. So you can very quickly and easily deploy them and start using them. And please don't put this part in the video when it goes up on the internet. But there's my email address. If you have questions, if you have comments, if there's anything I can do to help, feel free to reach out. By putting my email address up here, you can imagine I get a lot of emails, so it might take me a couple of days to respond, but you'll, you'll get a response, and now I'm gonna hide it. So please fill out the, uh, the Q&A or fill out the, the review in the app. We actually take those things very seriously. Um, sometimes the bad feedback is better than the good, but there's, there's always a uh, contest going on to see who can get the highest feedback, so you know, just keep that in mind if you had a good time on Friday morning. And with that, we can go to Q&A. Any questions? And I think we've got two microphones set up, or you can just shout at me. The tape gateway does not do dedupe. It does compression. So the volume gateway and the tape gateway, anything that gets written to them, gets compressed and encrypted before it gets sent to the service, but it does not do dedupe. Um, because it's emulating tape, a lot of the backup software will actually write dedupe data to it. And doing it that way, um, then the backup software always knows which barcode it needs to be able to put the data back together and rehydrate it. SFTP is great, but my industry requires AS2. I can connect the Amazon shop cart with AS2, the catalog exchange, but I can't connect to the AS, AWS environment. So are you going to offer managed AS2? That would be great. Did, did you get prompted for that question? By my boss. <laughs> We've heard that a few times. So um, transfer for SFTP is where we started. I can't, I can't comment on roadmap, but um, what I will tell you is that at AWS, we take customer feedback very seriously, and that's what drives innovation and drives roadmap. And the reason that I asked if you were prompted is because every time we've talked about SFTP, we've heard that exact same request. Um, and I see uh, Asa, she's got her hand up. She's in the back of the room. Asa is the general manager for the service. Um, so Asa can, feel free to have a conversation with Asa. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I had a question regarding sort of knowing where the data is stored. So if I have a customer that says I must keep the data within the same country, i.e. you're for EMEA and you're building now a data center in Sweden. So can I guarantee my customers that the data will stay in Sweden? Yes. For, for every service that we have talked about, you choose the region that the data lands in. So with Storage Gateway, you activate the Storage Gateway to a specific region. That's where it writes the data. With Snowball, you order it from a region. That's where it's going to write the data. With uh, AWS Data Sync, you tell us what EFS file system or S3 bucket you want it to go into, you've created all of those things. We will not put the data anywhere else. We are not going to move the data around. So you choose the region that the data is going to go into, and the only way that it's gonna go somewhere else is if you as a customer or as an administrator decide that you want to put it someplace else. I have a follow up on that one. Um, since I work a lot with defense companies, uh, you might have heard of, of ITAR. Um, I guess you can do that in, in the Gov Cloud here in the US, but um, is there any way of ensuring customers, if they're in a specific country outside of the US, that we can do the storage and handling of data so we fulfill that country's ITAR equivalent? So you, you have just left my knowledge base. <laughs> Um, the, the security stuff around things like that, those regulations and, and compliance I, for I, other countries, is yeah. I just don't have the depth of knowledge. If you want to send me an email, yeah. um, if you got my address, if not, I'll, I'll give you my email address. I, I'm happy to try and hook you up with somebody that can answer the question, but I, unfortunately, I don't know the answer. It's more or less, it can't cross borders. That's, the data can't cross borders. Right. But I'll talk to my uh, AWS representative in Sweden. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, Eric. 
Can I do HA for the storage gateway? You cannot do HA for storage gateway today. Um, as I mentioned before that uh, I can't comment on roadmap, but I can tell you that we, we take customer feedback very seriously and that, that we've had that request quite a bit. Um, if you're running in a VMware environment, and even hyper there are some things that you can do that sort of feel like HA, but it's, it's not failover, but it will help you come back online fairly quickly. One thing about all the storage gateway models is that they're essentially stateless. And that means that if, if the VM fails or if the hypervisor fails or the hardware fails, you know, on a file gateway, you can stand another one up, give it the same name, give it the same IP, point it at the same S3 bucket, and to the clients, it's going to look the same. The, the only potential for anything negative is that if you've written a bunch of data to it and it hasn't cleared the cache and it's not all up in S3 and the hardware dies, then you know, that data was in the cache and it's, it's not gonna be up in the service, so you'd have to resend that data. But other than that, you can, you can very quickly and easily stand up a new storage gateway instance and give it the personality of the old one and even point it at the same data set and make it available. In fact, we had a customer in Houston when they had the hurricane that when they got back to their data center, it was under many, many feet of water, and they did all their backups to AWS. They actually stood up um, storage gateway VTLs into a different region, and we were able to connect it back to the same data source, and they were able to restore all of their data, even though their main data center was underwater. So you've, you've got some flexibility there. Yes. Yeah, it looks like data sync is, uh, is currently limited to NFS only. Um, are there plans to expand capabilities to iSCSI others? I'm going to throw that one to Asa in the back of the room. I could give the same answer that, that we... Yeah, again, we, we don't... You know, pub this is getting recorded going on the internet, so we don't publicly talk about roadmap. Sure. But we are very heavily driven and influenced by our customers' feedback and input onto what products and protocols we should build next. Okay, please. So, awesome. duly noted. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys very much for getting up early and, and coming out.